All right, let's get this started. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Andrew Root, uh, Drew Root at Drupal.org. I'm from the San Diego community. I actually organize a lot of the community events in San Diego. So if you've been to our uh, sand camp or any of our events down there, uh, you probably recognize me from those. Um, I uh, also do uh, a lot of uh, general Drupal work. And recently, I've been um, working in Drupal 7 and commerce. And um, I was really excited about it and why uh, uh, I like to think about why it's it's better than Ubercart because I, I think it's a lot better. Um, so I wanted to kind of uh, share that share that information with you and uh, my experiences building my first commerce site and um, how that worked out for me. Um, so I wanted to uh, just kind of take a look around the room. Um, who here has actually built a site with Ubercart before? Okay, so a good good number of you, most of you. Um, and uh, okay, that's uh, some good information. Um, so I'm going to go over a, a few things here. Um, I'm going to go uh, over a, a basic installation, uh, some concepts, uh, how we set up products, uh, which is a, a little different in commerce than it is in Ubercart. Uh, I'll also go over the checkout process, um, some of the customizations that you can do uh, pretty easily. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, coding towards the end if we have enough time. So. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, get started. And uh, I wanted to basically tell you why I really think commerce is, is cool. Um, it's very flexible. It's a flexible system. Uh, and it's built on a lot of Drupal 7 um, constructs and best practices. So uh, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's pretty good code. And it uh, hooks into a lot of systems like views and rules that make it very configurable. And that kind of stuff wasn't very configurable in Ubercart. Um, so a lot of times in Ubercart, when you wanted to change something, you had to do a pretty heavy-handed override and really copy a huge block of code, modify it a little bit to meet your standards, and really do a lot of theming to get a very basic, uh, basic change to your cart or something like that. Because there just weren't enough hooks. It wasn't hooked into enough things. And it's a big pain. Uh, but of course, we all had to do it because you know that's how you build sites in uh, in Drupal, uh, at least in Drupal six. So, in Drupal seven, we actually do have two choices. Uh, Ubercart has been uh, ported, so you can use that if you want to use a straight up port. But um, one of the problems is uh, it doesn't really match a lot of you know how we do things in, in D seven now. Um, we're we're using uh, things like entities and fields and views, and Commerce uh, utilizes all those things and. Um, uh, Ubercart doesn't utilize them quite as well, at least not in a configurable fashion. Uh, you know, another thing that's nice is most of the, um, since most of the configuration has been moved into the database, a lot of times that's a problem because you need to be able to move it. But fortunately, all of those things are exportable. Things like views, things like rules can all be exported to code, uh, but they can also be done and overridden in the database layer. So it's really uh, convenient to be able to define uh, defaults in code <laughs> check those into version control, and if your customers want to override them, they can. Or you can override them and re-roll your features or anything like that. So it's uh, very flexible in that case. And uh, because of this flexibility, commerce can satisfy more use cases with less customization and saves us all time. Um, so uh, just a real quick basic information on the installation. Uh, there are several modules um, that commerce has. You can just add them to your site if you've already got an existing site. But if you don't already have an existing site, you probably want to check out the Commerce Kickstart module, or uh, not module, profile, excuse me. There's a, a couple commands here. Uh, you can see if you go to the, um, the Get Instructions tab on the Commerce Profile page, uh, this line is pulled straight from there. So uh, basically, we're cloning uh, from Drupal.org and getting the Commerce installation profile. And then once you do that, you have to make it, um, use uh, Drush Make to go ahead and make it. And it downloads all the dependencies, checks them, make sure you have current versions of things, um, basically builds the stack for you. So it's really convenient to be able to do that, make sure you have all the, um, all the dependencies. Uh, I used Commerce Kickstart for my first couple projects because I didn't actually know how it was laid out, and I wanted it to kind of be laid out as they had defined. Uh, and then I found when I was actually building uh, regular sites, I just wanted to add the modules because, you know, I didn't want every module that they include in the profile. So uh, once you get used to commerce, you probably won't use the Kickstart, but it's good to explore and check it out and see how they've configured things.
So on to some basic concepts of commerce. Uh, one of the, uh, the things that really got me at first is uh, the products aren't nodes. So I installed it, and the first thing I did is I went to go uh, the node ad page, and I was like, where are, my, where are my products? I don't see them here. They're not on the node ad page. I'm lost. Um, but they're entities. They're actually uh, within the store. Um, if you go to the store menu, you can pull down, and uh, there's uh, products, and you know, very similar to a node, um, but it's its own entity. Uh, if you've been uh, using Drupal 7 at all, you've probably seen that lots of modules are starting to find their own entities, and we're really moving away from the everything as a node model. Um, but we do uh, we do use nodes in, in commerce, uh, and it's one of the really confusing points, at least from the user perspective, is because you kind of need two things to display a product. You need a product, and you need a display node. Uh, and the display node references the product through a product reference field. Um, and this takes a while to wrap your head around, and uh, the first time I was like, why did they do this? I, I can't figure out why they would want us to have, you know, two different uh, modules, or uh, two different items. But, um, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it's actually a pretty flexible model, and it's actually how they handle attributes. Um, so there's some really cool stuff with the pl display formatters and some of the field API stuff that they've put in there uh, that makes attributes um, pretty interesting in how they load them up. Um, so uh, I'll go into that a, a little bit uh, a little bit later. Uh, another thing that's really nice is the checkout process is configurable, which is great. Um, so out of the box, there are four steps that you can utilize, um, and uh, they're all optional, and you can move panes in and out of them. So I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, it's really convenient to be able to do that. Uh, and the other thing that's really nice is the extensible uh, extensive views integration makes a lot of these things really easy to go change the shopping cart. When you had to do a, a theme override in Ubercart, you can literally click edit view, add field, and you've got an image or something like that. So uh, it's really really nice to have those configurable views. So as I was mentioning uh, a little bit before, uh, the product setup is uh, a little strange to wrap your head around at first, um, but basically what you're going to do is you're going to create a bunch of products through the store interface, and those are entities. Uh, and entities, of course, are fieldable just like nodes. Um, and uh, of course, nodes are fieldable, and you need one of each, generally. Um, they're not always one-to-one, -one, but in the most simple uh, store cases, they generally are one-to-one. -one. Um, but you need both of them. So one of the things that I struggle with is, what do I field? I can field nodes, I can field products, where's the appropriate place to go? I actually don't really know the definitive answer because you know I just kind of picked. Uh, I decided that we wanted it to go uh, with the products. Um, so that way when they're filling out the product information, they fill it out in one place. Uh, and I actually use a module called Product Display Manager to automatically create the display nodes because my clients were not happy about having to fill out two forms. <laughs> Um, they were actually not willing to do it. Uh, so uh, the, there's a module called Product Display Manager, uh, which helps you link your products to your nodes. Um, so the way I have it set up is that I have all of my fields on my products uh, and virtually none of the ones on the nodes, except for a few kind of display and theme type settings. Um, most of the product data and, um, and anything related to the product is... is part of the product and it's brought in through a relationship. Do we have a question back there? Yeah. Is it better to go, when you're going one to many, is it better to go one product to many uh, display notes or is it better to go uh, Generally it's one display note to many products and that's how we do attributes actually. So if you had say a green shirt and a blue shirt and a red shirt, uh, those would all be different products but they would share the same display note if you were looking for an attribute type model. And maybe, you know, red dye is really expensive, so the red shirts are more, or uh, larges are more, or something like that. So you can set up different prices for different products. They can have different descriptions. They can actually have every different field. And um, the field formatter brings all that stuff in and um, actually uh, changes it for you. Um, so when you select from a dropdown, if you select the red shirt, the image will change, the description will change, the title will change, the price will change, any field you set there will change. So it's really cool how that works because it's not just, you know, give me the red one and then parentheses $4 or something like that. You actually select this, it Ajax updates everything, 
and um, you got a, a new page with a new product. Uh, yeah, question? Can handle uh, multiple attributes? Well, attributes are really kind of uh, like fields on the product now, and uh, you can have as many fields as you want. Um, and when you select the different product in your, um, sorry, let me back up a little bit. When you're looking at a display node, um, a display node references a product through a product reference field. And there's a display formatter for that, uh, which is an add to cart form. And if there are uh, multiple products referenced, they'll have a select list. It's a, it's a pretty smart display formatter. It looks at what's, uh, what's referenced. If there are multiple, it gives you a selection form. So it's pretty smart in what it's, what it's doing there. And if you select one of the other options, uh, it instantly uh, reloads or AJAX loads and pulls in all the new data. So um, basically entities are fields on a product and you've got a product for every, basically every SKU you might have or every, everything is going to be a product. And you might actually have only, uh, you might have several products for one display node and then every time you uh, actually um, check it, it's going to bring in all that stuff. So yeah, it handles multiple, uh, and multiple attributes very well. Um, so uh, the next thing to check out is the uh, checkout process. <laughs> um, so like I said, there are four basic steps here. Um, I'll uh, take a look at them and show you the user interface in just a second. Actually, I think I have a, yeah, here we go. Um, so we've got the, uh, the checkout step, the review order step, the payment step, and the checkout complete step. And you see how these have drag and drop items in there? These are what we call panes. So uh, we can have a whole bunch of these and we can move them and drag them and drop them around from one step to another step. Uh, and we can actually drag a, everything out of a step and have that step just be skipped. Uh, so you can put everything into the checkout step and have a one page checkout, which is awesome. Because <laughs> if you ever tried to do that in Ubercart, you probably wanted to give up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but at the same time, it also enables you to make uh, four steps or three steps or however many steps you want. And that was a huge pain. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, I actually haven't tried adding a, a different step. I think there's a hook for it. I'm not 100% sure. Um, most of this stuff is uh, defined by hooks. Actually, all these panes are defined by hooks, and I will show you the hooks for defining the panes uh, towards the end, if we have time. Um, I believe there's a hook for that, but I'm not totally sure. Uh, I haven't had to add more than one. In fact, in the store that I was creating, uh, they decided that three steps was appropriate, so I disabled one of these, and we have a three-step checkout process. But to me, the ability to drag and drop these and decide how many steps you are uh, through a simple-to-use form like this is absolutely invaluable. So I was really excited to see that. Um, so getting over to uh, some of the views integration, uh, Commerce leverages views very heavily. Um, it uses views for uh, lots of even small small things like line items. Uh, it has a view, it calls it, embeds it uh, with code uh, kind of beneath the scenes. Um, so uh, there are lots of views that come out of the box, uh, probably too many to really uh, look at and talk about. But uh, if you kind of uh, look over that, you'll see with the titles kind of what they are and what they describe. Um, and those generally will um, change the, uh, the layout of something on the site, like line items is a good example. Um, if you look how line items are rendered, it's basically embedding a view. Um, so all that stuff's configurable. But the thing that's really cool is that the cart is actually completely configurable, and the cart is actually just a view. So you can change that really easily. Um, so let me actually show you what that's like. Jump out here real quick. Thanks. 
All right, so um, just for reference, this is the last thing I had up. This is the uh, drag and drop pane, so it's nice because you can drag, thing, drag things like uh, the shopping cart around, move it, and uh, if you want to move the review step, um, take payment as the last thing or the first thing, you can do all that. Um, all, some of these options have uh, configuration options in here. Um, you can include, include it on the review checkout pane, which is um, actually that step that we just looked at and moved around a little ways. Um, so there's lots of configurable options there. But, uh, but let's check out the cart, though. Um, so this is just uh, a really quick. Uh, I actually did this a few minutes before. Um, I just installed uh, Kickstart with that git command and uh, drush make. So this is absolutely fresh right out of the box uh, with the installation profile. Um, and there's an option within the installation profile to create some sample products. So that's what these are. I didn't actually make these. Um, so I just added one to cart, and then you know my shopping cart um, block showed up on the sidebar there. Um, so you can see all the uh, information here. This is just a basic block. It's small and designed to be in the sidebar. But if you wanted to change this, um, you can move the block or change the view or uh, really do anything you wanted there. Um, so we've got uh, hover links, so it makes it really easy to get into these and edit these um, with some of the Drupal 7 user uh, UX improvements and uh, commerce actually hooking into views and using them. So we can go change that, get a nice overlay. And then uh, this is one of the things that's kind of uh, kind of the, the magic in the views is the relationship between the uh, product and the display node. So uh, generally you have a view of nodes and you need this uh, relationship to be able to gather all the fields from the commerce uh, products. So uh, those come obviously installed with all the default views, but if you wanted to make a view, uh, you can make a, a, any view that displays all of your display nodes, but if you want access to your product information, you just have to make sure the reference is there. And that's just the uh, product reference field that is basically on every display node. So just as a proof of concept here, I'll just remove something. Say I, I'm not interested in quantity in that sidebar block because I, you know, maybe I want more space for some graphic elements or something. Um, so I'll just go ahead and remove that from the view and save that. And then uh, the overlay dies and uh, the page refreshes and hey, my stuff's uh, my quantity's not there. So uh, it makes it really easy to change that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we've got view card and checkout links. Um, so we can check out. Uh, this is actually a different block. Uh, it's a different copy of the block. So there are um, a few different. There's a shopping cart summary, a shopping cart form, and a shopping cart block. Uh, you can all put them in different places and customize them differently. Um, I think this is the... Uh, let's see. Yeah, so this is the cart summary. Um, so we can add fields here. Let me just show you real quick. Um, oh, another thing that's nice about Kickstart is it gives you, uh, it actually sets some of the shortcut links for you. So I didn't set these up either, but they, uh, they show up so you can know where to look for stuff. Um, so let me just go. Actually, I want to configure one, add a field to that real quick. Um, so I'm going to go to store products, product types. Um, so you have the ability to add lots of different product types. Uh, this probably uh, is pretty similar to product classes in Ubercart that you've seen before. Um, so if you've got like books or movies or shirts or something that's specific, you can make a particular uh, product type. Uh, and this is basically just a, um, a different entity that you can assign different fields to. Um, so let me just uh, do that real quick. I'll, I'll call it game because I've been 
selling lots of games recently. So now I've got two different types of products. Um, and I can manage the fields. Uh, like I said, entities are completely fieldable, so you can add all your stuff here. So let's just add a quick text field. So we'll call it sample text field product text. So this is just pretty basic field type stuff. And then when you edit the view, you can add a field for that. Oh, you know, and I added, that, I added that to the brand new type that I just added. I should have probably added it to the uh, existing one because that's what this is showing. So uh, that's, uh, you, you can add fields through uh, relationships. It works, I promise. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, let's uh, move on there. I wanted to uh, show a little bit of the, uh, of the code while I had a chance. So let me jump back to my presentation. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, about coding because uh, I've been working with uh, some of this stuff. Um, particularly, most of what I've been doing is customizing the checkout process, which, if you've been working in UberCard, is probably the most common thing that you generally do. Other than theming products and stuff like that. Um, so uh, the biggest thing I've been doing is adding commerce panes. Um, so I added a bunch of custom panes that have um, some AJAX callbacks and. Uh, have some markup and stuff to match the comps that we wanted, some custom form elements. So I've been putting in a lot of custom stuff in there. So uh, I wanted to show you um, this hook. So this is an implementation of hook commerce checkout pane info. So this is how you define extra panes. And this is in one of my customization modules. Um, sorry, that's probably pretty hard to read. I don't think I can make it any bigger either. Sorry. Um, but uh, basically, this uh, info hook allows you to define uh, checkout panes. And all you have to do is define an array with a few basic, um, basic entries. Uh, what's really important here is uh, base is the base name of the function that you want to use. Uh, and it's going to build, uh, build your submit handler uh, and your validation handler and stuff off that. So I'll show you that in a second. Uh, also, uh, I don't believe it has to be in an include file, but um, generally uh, the best practice is to put these uh, panes into an include file. Uh, so that's laid out in file there. And then another key thing to look at is page. Uh, so that can define the default page that it shows, in, shows up on the checkout configuration screen. Uh, and then there are several other options uh, if you look at the API. One is uh, locked. So you can't move it uh, from the display screen, uh, but the default, of course, is unlocked because you want to be able to move stuff around in most cases. Um, so let me show you. Uh, let's see, do I? Have... Oh yeah, here we go. So uh, this is a uh, one of the callback include or one of the include functions or included files. Uh, so you can see this has the form. Uh, this is actually. Let's see. Okay, so this is a include for something that's not actually listed on here. This is an Ajax um, checkout form. So this is uh, something I did to extend the commerce coupon module, uh, which is kind of uh, lagging a little bit, so I had to do some, uh, some work to get it up to speed. 
but uh, I basically made a uh, Ajax form for it so it could be submitted um, quickly without uh, having to refresh the checkout page. Um, so uh, you can see the we've got USA Checkout is the name of my module, um, and the name of the pane is Coupon Ajax, uh, and uh, the checkout form is the um, signature from the hook. So let me go back here. So you can see uh, the base I have uh, in here is USAO checkout pane. Um, in the definition for Ajax, it's USAO checkout pane underscore Ajax. Ajax checkout form. And then you can see below here, uh, you can also define validator, validators and submit handlers. Uh, I'm not doing this because I'm using Ajax, and these things are bypassed because I'm using Ajax. Um, so I have my callbacks in a different location. But if uh, you weren't required to use Ajax and you could submit the page reloads, this is where you would put your validation and submit handlers. So it's kind of nice to have this all in and include files, uh, keep it together, and keep it clean. Um, so another topic I wanted to talk about was uh, rules. Uh, Commerce uses rules really extensively, and it makes it extremely configurable because it uses rules. Uh, the new rules engine is really powerful. You have a question? Your, your, your card six did conditional actions, right? I believe so, and um, unless there was a, a contrib to make it work with rules, I don't know. The yeah. Why right. Well, originally when they wrote. Um, uh, Ubercart, they uh, they wanted to use rules, but it wasn't ready, and conditional actions was, and they just kind of went with it because they wanted to get it out the door. Um, but uh, rules has matured a lot, uh, and actually, it's extremely powerful. Uh, uh, Drupal Seven Rules Three uh, is is really nice. Um, the API is really strong and powerful, um, and that's actually um, what I wanted to show you here. So, uh, this is an example from Commerce Shipping. Uh, which is a contributed module. It's actually not part of core. Uh, and if anyone has questions about shipping, you should ask me later because it's kind of tricky. Um, but uh, this is just a, a common uh, module that provides some, some rules. So you can see there are two important hooks here. Uh, you've got rules event info and rules action info. Event info defines events that you can you know, basically take actions on. and The actions define things you can do when those events get triggered. Um, so we've got uh, uh, the shipping module is defining basically a rule that says uh, when you're checking out, um, you want to enable a shipping method. If you have lots of shipping methods, you might have something more complex here, like uh, if it's over four pounds, use the shipping method. If it's under uh, four pounds, use a, a different shipping carrier or something like that. Uh, the general rule doesn't actually really do much if you only have one method. Uh, it just enables it when it's checking out. But uh, if you've got multiple methods, it's nice to be able to switch around, uh, switch around with those. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the I think the action, um, the action <coughs> infos are a little bit more interesting because um, you can provide uh, some parameters. Uh, and uh, if you look on the uh, rules user interface, um, you've got an opportunity to say uh, what, uh, what parameters are here. And, uh, if you've worked with uh, rules three, you see the uh, data selectors. And that's what they're defining here with these parameters. Um, also, uh, the group, you can group rules together, which is nice because so many things are using rules now. Um, it's nice to keep them grouped together if you can in your code because uh, otherwise your rules will spiral out of control because lots of things are starting to integrate with rules and your rules page um, will have lots of things, so group them up. Um, so let's actually check out the rules interface. I wanted to show you the uh, front side for that. Um, so I'll use shipping as an example here. Have that module on and check out the modules. Oh, no, I don't have it because it's not part of the uh, installation profile. So I'll just show you the regular, uh, regular rules. 
um, which is under configuration. Another thing I don't really like about the profile is that it has uh, this helper bar at the top, and I prefer the admin menu with the drop downs. So I always kind of fumble around with this uh, user interface. I don't like it a whole lot. So uh, if you go to go to rules here, you can see a whole bunch of uh, rules that are defined. These are all default commerce rules. Um, here's a good one. Calculate sales tax. So let's take a look at that. Um, so when we're calculating the sell price of an object or a product uh, under no, uh, no conditions because we just want to do it all the time, uh, we want to calculate the taxes for a line item. Um, then we can edit that. Uh, and it tells you what uh, basically what object you want to uh, want to use. Uh, so if you open this up, you can see what the data selectors are. Uh, generally, for the default rules, uh, these are fine. But if you're actually make, if you're extending these rules, you need to tell rules what objects you want to operate on. Is it an order? Is it a line item? Uh, is it a product? Um, there's lots of things that you can take rules on. So when you're defining your own rules, you have to define these. But um, the default rules are, I found them to be a good way to figure out how the rules API works because I basically learned how to write my own rules by looking at these rules. So um, it's something important that you need to uh, consider when writing your own rules. Um, and then uh, you can add some additional uh, form items with the form API and rules too as well. Does anyone have any questions about rules? Okay. So I guess that's uh, yeah, I guess that's pretty much all I had. So um, does anyone have any particular questions about anything uh, I talked about? Yeah. Okay. Andrew, I understand this is It can be. Okay. How about if you'll say you know, the best like type business model where you're you're a marketplace enabling you know, small vendors to sell to um, the consumers, yeah. the consumers to sell to consumers. So they uh, pick around the transaction price. Mm -hmm. Their product is sent directly to the other person. All you're doing is taking a small percentage yep. of each transaction. Mm -hmm. Can that be done? And second, can it be done by the Um, so that can be done by leveraging the API. Um, you certainly need some custom work to be able to do that, but you're much more able to do that in commerce than you ever were with Ubercart. Because Ubercart really is designed for I'm adding products to a shopping cart, I'm going to check out with that shopping cart through the whole checkout process. And while commerce is built to do that, it's also built to remove things out of the checkout process and make it easier and make it simpler and make it so you can charge for you know something arbitrary that's maybe not a product, maybe it's just a line item. So a line item is another important object. Um, for example, uh, coupons uh, introduce a line item that has a negative price and is based on uh, the price of the object. So you can set a coupon, say 50% off, <laughs> and the coupon module um, creates a line item for you and that affects the price of your order. So in theory, you don't have to have products, cart, shopping, uh, any of that stuff. You can just create line items uh, and have a very simple checkout process. Um, just get their credit card information. Or there, there is some PayPal stuff. It's in the works. It's not ready yet. Um, Ryan, uh, the creator of this, is spearheading a lot of the contribs, uh, but he's also building the whole thing <laughs> uh, with, uh, with Damien and a, a lot of community support, obviously. But uh, he's very busy. Um, Working on the core and a lot of the um, a lot of things like PayPal and uh, coupons and authorized.net are um, they're they're pretty close to ready, but I, I think he just needs a, a little bit more time with them. Now that's an RC, I think he'll have more chance to kind of look at some of that stuff. Yeah, one, two. Um, what payment gateways do you know of work with Drupal Commerce now? Uh, I use authorized.net. Um, 
I think that's the, that's the one I've always used anyway. It's the one I always recommend. Um, so I, I try to pretty much always use that one. And that was the first one created. Uh, PayPal does actually exist in the website payments standard. And Pro is almost there. Um, but uh, And I think there are, there are a couple other ones. They're listed on, uh, there's a site, um, DrupalCommerce.org, uh, which is uh, the actual the Commerce Guys site. Uh, has a lot of information and forums and stuff there. So uh, there's a, a link to a page that lists all of the contribs and the status of them. Uh, and it's not always up to date, but it does at least point out uh, which contribs are there. Uh, I'm using authorized.net. That seems to work pretty well. Um, that's the only one I know of that, um, that really does work well. But I think there are others. I just haven't really looked into them. Uh, we had one over here and then uh, three, four. Oh, easy Uh, there is a migrate module, which I have not uh, not used, but I've heard that it works pretty well. Um, so, uh, this is Bob right now. Oh, there's a commerce migrate. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a module just for uh, migrating um, Ubercart to commerce. Uh, and uh, I haven't used it myself, but I've heard in IRC chatter that it has worked for other people. Uh, but I, I have no experience with it myself. Yeah, there's a question here. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, um, it's pretty easy. I've actually um, ported a, a few modules kind of uh, in a, a simple state. Uh, it's not, I mean, if you're comfortable looking at code, it's not too bad to look at an Ubercart module, grab the, the core code that's really important, and then move it over to, uh, to commerce. Um, so I had to do that, for example, with FedEx. Because uh, we had FedEx shipping, and shipping is uh, a huge pain, uh, particularly because, well, there just aren't any shipping methods, really. Uh, there are rules, and you can say, uh, you can really easily find within the rule system, hey, uh, give me five bucks for shipping on every product, or, you know, uh, five bucks per pound on shipping. So you can do a lot of the shipping uh, charges and stuff with rules, uh, and there is a shipping module to hook into some shipping methods, but there aren't really too many shipping methods, so I basically had to um, port... FedEx, and I grabbed all the um, useful code I could from the uh, from the Ubercar version, and I just changed some of the hooks and moved a few things around. It wasn't too hard to actually port the stuff. Uh, just one back here. Was that Rich? Oh yeah. Um, from the authorized uh, Yeah, uh, yeah, those don't exist yet. Uh, yeah, so a lot of stuff is springing up for commerce. Uh, I think the, the uh, hope is that people will jump in and start uh, porting some of those contribs because uh, a lot of that stuff does exist for Ubercart and you can just yank it right out and uh, write a module for it. So uh, hopefully that stuff will start uh, rising up pretty soon. But uh, the um, contributed modules for commerce are pretty minimal at the moment. Are there any good examples of the sites um, they have a showcase on DrupalCommerce.org. Uh, uh, there's nothing um, that I've found to be um, terribly impressive, but there are a lot of pretty basic, uh, basic cards out there. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think has been highlighted in some of the um, showcase stores is international pricing, because a lot of them are actually international stores, and uh, it handles uh, multiple prices uh, and international currencies really well. So. Uh, of the sites that I've seen in the showcase, several of them have been international, and a focus of them has been how well it's handled international pricing. Um, I come more from Magento Commerce, mm -hmm. so my question was about rules and taxes. Like, what do you do to all your taxes, like New York State taxes and shipping taxes to the rule mm -hmm. for commerce? Yep, so you can just define a whole bunch of uh, tax rules and any amount of yeah. tax rates you want. You can say if they want to be inclusive or exclusive, meaning uh, my product is $15 regardless of the tax, or it's $15 plus whatever the tax is. So you can combine those rules with shipping taxes and then location? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, uh, it uses very extensive rules integration. A lot of stuff is done with rules. Yeah, over here. Who dealt with the tax exemption issues or certain 
I haven't had to deal with that, but it sounds like rules could have a condition, whatever uh, whatever you have to check to find out if they're tax exempt, don't charge them. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, well, you would have to write a condition, so uh, I mean, you probably have to write your own rule. Um, you can uh, add a condition, um, and I don't know what the condition is. So in that case, probably it's a flag or something. Uh, but uh, yeah, exactly. You should also look at the code. Yeah. Um, well, the showcase I was talking about a little while ago is um, kind of uh, uh, where those are all listed. Uh, there aren't too many of them now, and they are mostly international sites. Um, so I haven't really seen uh, a lot of really like impressive themed sites. Uh, there will be one very soon because I'm building it, <laughs> but I can't uh, uh, tell you too much about it until it launches. <laughs> Uh, did anyone else have any questions about stuff? Um, yeah. Um, so the best way to do that is uh, with the feeds and uh, uh, feed importers. Uh, and there's actually one specifically for commerce products. Uh, so that will enable you to uh, ingest commerce products from either a feed on a different website or a CSV or something like that. Um, so that's probably the easiest way to get them in is the commerce feeds module. <coughs> yeah? Can you expand on the question? Affiliates? Um, no, but uh, I think it wouldn't be too difficult to build it in. Um, I, going back to the fact that it's just that configurable, I mean, you add a field to a product and um, uh, they can they can enter that, um, and um, that'll go through the order. It'll be part of the order um, when you load up the object. You'll get uh, access to all that. So, I mean, you could totally do it. Uh, it's just a matter of configuration. Anyone else? No? All right, cool. Well, thanks, everyone. If you have any questions, let me know. having to write too much custom code right, first quarter of next year, sooner than that? Um, I would say first quarter of next year probably would be, yeah, I would say it's probably going to be safe then. Uh, it's hard to say for sure, but uh, I think it's in release candidate right now, uh, which is relatively stable. Uh, obviously, we'd like to see it get to a 1.0 release. Uh, but I think what's most important is the status of the contribs that you need. So you kind of need to do a little bit of an analysis on the contributed modules that you need. And you know if they, if they don't exist, they need to get written. And you basically need to find out if someone's writing them or if you need to write them. Um, so, so who would the, I need to sort of nudge to get it done for you know, a few bucks in that direction, I think? Uh, the commerce guys? Yeah. So uh, they're, they're based in San Francisco because they've got two offices, haven't they? I believe they are based in San Francisco, yeah. Um, or just south. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm going to meet up on uh, Monday. Okay. I think they host. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, and it's if Brian you can, and Damien? Brian and Damien, yeah. And they're both uh, working with the commerce guy. They are, yeah. Um, I don't know where they are working out of. I know the commerce guys are... Or I think they're based in San Francisco. I'm not really sure where they're working. But yeah, if you can get a hold of uh, Ryan or Damien, uh, Ryan's always in IRC, um, so it's really easy to get a hold of an IRC. Um, you're actually a person. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. Um, do you do development yourself? Yeah. Do you have your own? Uh, I work with Transparatech, so Joel and I work together. Uh, I got in a white shirt back there. Uh, so. Um, I don't have any TT cards on me, but I do have a. This has my contact information on it. Brandy updated, but you can get in touch with me here. Okay. And it, the showcase you mentioned is that, uh, do you know if there's um, some of the examples there, profiled there, are they from robust? 
No, they're not really robust. Um, most of the sites have been pretty basic with it because a lot of the additional functionality doesn't exist yet. So the, it just it really lends itself to basic sites right now. And sites that sites that have already gone through uh, their creation and have been launched. I mean, it, it got released into RC like a few weeks ago. Oh, so uh, any site that's existing and up now was created during beta, which, trust me, was painful to do. <laughs> um, so they put a lot of work into it just to get it to, do, to be basic. Uh, and now it's in release candidate, so it's much stronger. But uh, at the time when the sites that are now up were being created, um, you wanted not to use the contrabs because stuff was just changing so much. Yeah. So I think it'll change change a lot, but right now the proof of concepts are pretty basic just because it's only been out for a little while. It's getting close. I mean, you wanted to consider it for enterprise uh, it definitely, or even B2B or... or uh, um, yeah, uh, enterprise would probably be a little uh, worried about it for a little while, mostly just because the contribs are lagging. Um, I mean, they're going to lag, obviously, because, you know, the API is changing. You need to catch up with those and stuff like that, so... Um, I would I would wait for the when the, when the contribs um, are either ready or you know not in beta anymore. I would say that's that's probably a pretty safe time to go for it. But uh, the problem that I've been running into is that the underlying code has been changing, and that means that the contribs if they didn't get updated they just broke. So like uh, coupon when I said I had to do a bunch of work to get it to work is because it was written four months ago and it, the API was completely different so a bunch of the functions just didn't exist I had to, had to change them and the maintainer hadn't looked at it since then so I have to write that mm -hmm. uh, so what time, what time frame do you think um, you know it's really hard to guess that kind of stuff and it depends very largely on your requirements and which contribs you need mm -hmm. but um, the guy who was just here who said early quarter next week or <laughs> Next year, um, yeah, I, I think that I think we probably will be ready before that. Okay, um, but you know, it really depends on your your situation, your requirements, and, you know, the contrib's status. Okay. Great, well, thank you. Yeah. Good yeah. job. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, like, I guess I could kind of do that for the failure like, tracking. Could you like track? Like, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't even think about that. But yeah. That's a great way to do it. So, yeah, that's actually just worded. Yeah. So is that like a separate add-on or is that part? Yeah. Uh, so commerce coupon is the module. Um, it's a little bit out of date, so if you have trouble working with it, um, you can either ask questions in the IRC uh, channel. Um, sometimes there's lots of help there, other times it's like crickets. Yeah, um, but uh, if you have trouble specifically with Commerce Coupon, um, you can ask me questions, you can hit me up on my contact form on Drupal.org. Um, and uh, let me know if you have any specific questions because I did have to do some specific I, I things. Do, yeah. I do have like a, a specific use case. So what I'm doing is um, yeah. it's, it's, I'm doing a travel card period and I'm even considering whether to go to the travel card or not. Someone else told me maybe I should do it. So what I'm trying to do is it's a membership based, or subscription based site and anonymous users are anonymous users, but then as they become.